Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer addressing students of Dallas Theological Seminary in Lectures on the Spiritual Life. Lecture number three, Power to Overcome Evil, Subtopic two, The Flesh. Enter your heart. 
And uh, but the fight of the flesh is inward, and it's far more metaphysical and more subtle in all its uh, condition. We have to take ample time here. But I've tried to point out that the thing that things that are hardest for a teacher to get others to acknowledge and believe for themselves is first that they have the spirit within them. Then second, that Christ has, that there is an, an evil nature, a satanic, Adamic evil nature in you, which is prone to evil and is enmity against God. And it's going to dishonor God continually unless that thing is controlled. Now, I have, I have emphasized that, that side of it somewhat already. But do you really believe that you have a, a fallen nature? When you turn to, uh, Romans chapter 6, chapter 6, 7, and part of 8, and the first chapter of 1 John, you have a distinction, which I don't know whether I pointed out in print or not. I remember. You have a distinction between S-I-N sin and S-I-N-S sin. Sin is the root nature that produces S-I-N-S sins, and sins are the, the fruit of, the, of sin, the nature. And the word sin occurs constantly in Romans 6, 7, part of 8, and 1 John chapter 1. And that it must be seen not as the bad things that we do call sins, but as the nature which prompts it the nature which prompts it. And as quick as you begin to see it in that light, then you, the truth takes on a new meaning altogether. I shall turn to it in a moment. The incident is told of a, of a man in England who attended prayer meeting every Wednesday night in his church and always got up and said the same thing at every prayer meeting. And the people were patient with him. He said, another week has passed, and it becomes me to confess my sins that the cobwebs of sin may be wiped away. He said it once too many times, and a small boy spoke up and said, will somebody kill his spiders, please? <laughs> Once somebody kills these spiders, of course, if you can kill the spiders, they won't be on the spider web. Any housekeeper knows that. But do you kill the spiders? No, you do not. That's not God's plan. You have in these holiness movements the pretense and suggestion that uh, this sin nature can be eradicated. And I've lifted my voice against that to you because no nature can ever be eradicated. It cannot be, possibly, and never is eradicated. There isn't such a thing that ever took place on the face of the earth as the eradication of the sin nature. Not a thing. The day's coming when you leave it all behind, and it'll be a, perhaps an experience very much like driving a car when all the brakes are set as tight as they can be, and suddenly they're taken off, and Away it goes, you know, as loose and free as can be with the brakes off. And what's it going to mean when this whole thing is left behind? I don't know. I'm waiting to see. I'm just waiting to see. But now do you have a sin nature, fellas? Are you willing to acknowledge it? Or are you going to stick out and say, no, no, I'm bad, but I can overcome it. Give me time and... and uh, Patience, and I'll overcome it. You never will overcome it in this world, never in this world. 
It's there. Now turn to Romans 7, please. We shall have a little... I shall start at 6 first, as long as I've spoken about the word sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue bearing the fruit of sin nature that grace may abound? The man in Philadelphia said to me once, and he was the president of a Bible school at the time. He said to me, if I believe what you believe about grace, he said, I'd go out and I'd have the biggest fling that a man ever had in the world. And I said, by so much you've told me that you're not born again. Because that's not the language of a born again person. What does a born again person say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid the voice of the Christian because he has a divine nature. Now we have two natures from the moment that we are saved. We have two natures. I'm not saying we're two personalities at all. We are one person, but we have two tremendous tendencies. And one is you can be very pious, and the other is you can be very wicked. Because you've got the ability in these two natures and the trouble is most of us gauge ourselves by the divine nature that we have and its tendencies and imagine that's the whole of it. It isn't. There's a lot more. Now go down, please, to verse 14 in chapter 6. The sin nature shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law but under grace. Now let me say that uh, in this portion that we have come upon, beginning with the 6th chapter and running on into the 8th of Romans, while it deals with the sin nature, it is addressed only to Christians who, are, who have come through and have possessed everything that's been described in the previous part of the epistle. This will never work on any unsaved person. Don't think for a moment that it could ever, ever be made to work on an unsaved person. Can't do it. It doesn't belong to them. It's just for those that are definitely and positively saved. Now in here you have six or seven different meanings to the word law. And you've simply got to have some idea what you're talking about or you don't know very much about it. And in this particular instance, the word law, you're not under law. As a rule of life, you're not under the Mosaic law. Now, I told you yesterday of a book that is published on just off the press on supposed to be systematic theology by Fitzwater of the Moody Bible Institute. And when he tries to tell Christians what they ought to do, he goes to the Ten Commandments just the same as the uh, as the Confession of Faith that the Presbyterian Church does. And Fitzwater gives a whole chapter to each one of these Ten Commandments, applying them to the Christian. And he gets in such a mess when he gets to the fourth one, because fourth doesn't ever apply on the Sabbath day. <clears throat> now then, here we have reference to the Mosaic system uh, as a guide for the life. Sin, the nature shall not have dominion over you because you're not under the Mosaic system but under grace. What does the passage mean? Well, I can put it in simple form. I Sin nature shall not rule over you because you're in a new system that provides something whereby you don't have to be you don't have to be conquered by it. Then never was any provision in the Mosaic system for anybody to live to the glory of God. They had no divine help whatever. You can't find such a thing as any divine enablement in the life when you come to the 
question of the sin nature. You're not in the old system that provided nothing, but you are in the new system. And he's a right to say that at this point because he's described it all in the preceding verses, which I'm not undertaking to do this morning because we're going to have to spend considerable time on that very shortly. But I'm moving on. Now you come to chapter 7, please. And you have startling words here. In chapter 7, you have two illustrations. The first one in the first verse, and the next one begins with the second verse. And don't mix the two, they're not continuation of one thing. The man who is in the first illustration becomes, uh, is illustrated in the next one by the woman. You can't mix those two things. I begin at verse 2, for the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she be married to another man. What's it all about? Well, you have, whatever relation you ever had to the Mosaic law, you're dead. I read on here. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law, to the Mosaic system, by the sacrificial body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. And your new life now is a life which is married to another, even the resurrected Christ, in order that there might be fruit born to his glory. Now we'll look at verse 6. Yeah. Ye are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein ye were held, that ye should serve in newness of spirit. In other words, this woman... There's an illustration of coming out from and under the law of the first husband and coming under the law of the second husband. And so, you are married to another when you're saved. And you're not still married to the old one. Be careful now. We have, uh, we have a common use of the word polygamy which means that a man is living with more than one wife. And there's another word which is not so familiar, and that's polyandry, which means that a woman is living in, with more than one husband. Now be careful about spiritual polyandry. Don't try to live with the old husband and the new husband both at the same time. That is just plain polyandry. Keeping the corpse of the first husband in the front room and living with the second husband in the kitchen. No, not that at all. You have nothing to do with the first husband. He is dead and gone. And all the relationship is broken completely. Now, it's strange, isn't it, that a man as capable as Fitzwater should not have stumbled sometime on a thing like this. That would check him a little from saying that we, we are under obligation to do all of Israel's requirements in keeping the law. We are not, but we're not Israel, that's why. Now move over to verse 15, please. And I take up again the <coughs> statement that I have made, that you have two natures. You have a sin nature. And you have the new divine nature. And now the Apostle Paul, early in his life, Christian life, came upon a conflict, a very serious conflict. And it was some time before he was uh, able to get out of his difficulties. And he records it here 
It's in the first person. And there are two eyes. I start out to be good and I find evil is present with me. In other words, there is civil war in my own being. I have a conflict in my own being. Now, if you should find that same thing true of yourself, you're in good company because you're in the same company with the great apostle. Don't think that you can't lower your dignity enough to say that you have two natures when Paul did it here so plainly. Now, I hold that every Christian ought to be able to read what begins with the 15th verse on to the end intelligently and assign the meaning to each of these eyes as they stand up in conflict. I want you to do that, men. I want you to do that. I'm going to read it for you. Now, supposing the old nature is called the old just for convenience, and the new nature is called the new just for convenience. Sometimes I call them Saul and sometimes Paul. Saul and Paul. But it's the old and the new. And he's got them both. Whether you think you have or not, Paul found out he had both of them. For that which I, the old do, I, the new, allow not. For that which I, the new, would, that I, the old, do not. For what I, the new, hate, that I, the old, do. I want you to work on this, man, until you can read it yourself and assign this and see the argument of the accumulation here. You must do that. It's very complicated. I was teaching in uh, Holland. I had a man interpreting for me from the English into the Dutch. And when I came to this, he was a former student of mine in the classes. I came to this in, in teaching it was at Antwerp in Belgium, but we were, we were having to ha- handle the Dutch, we were all the congregation were Dutch. And I just knew that I couldn't translate this, couldn't get this thing over by translation. So I turned to him and I said, Kay, you know what I believe about these eyes, don't you? He said, sure I do. Well, I said, go ahead and teach it. And I said, Alan. <laughs> And I waited till he got through. Kay Rosendahl, I don't think you, George, ever met him. Your father knows him. Well, it would be hard to make a translation of this, you can be sure. Someone said, would you have difficulty in teaching Romans 6 to an average audience? Yes, I guess so. And Romans 7, too. You've got to build up to it, man. If then I, the old, do, that which I, the new, would not, I am at least consenting unto the law of God that it's a good thing. Now the word law is the will of God. The will of God. I am consenting to the will of God that it's a good thing. I don't know any rule or set of rules to give you concerning the interpretation here of this word law, only the context as it runs. Now then, it is no more I, the old, that do it, but as I am sin, the nature that dwelleth in me. Now notice, that dwelleth in me, and go on to verse 19, or verse 20, sin that dwelleth in me, And verse 23, sin which is in my members, that's a confession now from the Apostle Paul, sin that dwelleth in me twice, and sin that is in my members. And then at verse 18, please, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, 
dwell it no good thing. I have it, but I dwell no good thing in it. You don't wonder that in the eighth chapter he says that it's enmity against God and cannot be subject to the law of God, possibly. This thing called the flesh, which Paul had and which I have and which you have, whether you've ever come to admit it or not. Uh, I know that in me, that in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. Why? Because I have another nature. There's a tendency in me to be good. For the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. I set out, I, I bite my lip and I clench my fist and I determine and I resolve and I say that from this time forth I'm going to be victor over this thing and I'm not, I'm not because I cannot control it. I cannot control the flesh. And that's the conflict that's in this passage. There are various ways of interpreting it or some right and one, one is right and the others are wrong. What I'm saying here to you men is this, that for the time being, the Christian is uh, contemplated as, for the moment, divorced from the Spirit. And can't he live the life just because he is a Christian? Just because he's a Christian, I suppose that's the most subtle temptation that's going to come into your conflict is that you think, well, I'm saved, of course I can do it. You've got to learn that when you're saved, you can't do it. You've got to be, you've got to be enabled by the Spirit. Now in Galatians chapter 5, you have another conflict. If by the Spirit you're walking, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Spirit lusteth against the flesh, and the flesh against the Spirit. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you otherwise would. In other words, now the controversy is between the spirit and the flesh. And the victory is sure between the spirit and the flesh. But now between myself, my Christian self, my saved self, and the flesh. What about that? I'm, I am defeated. And you have here Paul's testimony of an awful defeat. Now you've got the country just filled with preachers. If you could have stopped into all the services that were held last Sunday between the Atlantic and Pacific, you'd have heard a mess of sermons. And all of them could have been boiled down to two words. Just two words. Be good. Be good. But how many sermons were preached last Sunday to tell people how to be good? How to be good. They just don't know anything about that. That involves the plan of deliverance from the reigning power of sin. And I've tried to tell you that that's the, that's one of the most neglected things. A thing that isn't taught so far as I know in any school in this country excepting here. Right in this class. The only place where it's taught in any school. How to be good? Well, uh, God has a way and a plan and a provision, but you've got to know and understand it. And I'm just ambitious enough to hope that you men are going to get it so that you can teach it. You can teach it. And don't say it's a too big a job to make the average audience here understand. They've got to understand if they're Christians. Of course they've got to understand. Now read on. For the good that I the new would, I the old do not. Where does it come from? I've just been in prayer, and my heart has been lifted up with fellowship with God. And then strangely, some most frightful and awful thing passes through my mind. Where did that thing come from? And so I say, where did that slimy thing come from? It didn't come from the new nature. It came from the old nature. And I've got to be able to identify it. So, so, so then, for the good that I the new would, I the old do not. 
but the evil which I, the old one, that I, they knew, do not. Just again, identifying the source from which evil comes in the Christian's heart. Don't miss that, men. Now, if I, the old do, what that I, the new, would not, it is no more I, the new, that do it, but sin, the nature that dwelleth in me. Have you got it, men? Have you got that nature? For I delight in the will of God after the inward man. Don't expect any unsaved person to ever do that because they have no inward man, uh, no spiritual inward man. And all the attempts that have been made to try to interpret this passage on the ground that it was an experience of Paul's before he was saved break down because he had no such experience. He was a Pharisee living in all good conscience before the law, before he was saved. And he never had any such struggle until a new nature came in. Then there was a conflict. And ideals were set up which he couldn't meet. And he was disappointed in himself. But I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind. And now here the mind is equivalent to the new nature and bringing me into captivity to the power or law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched Christian that I am, defeated Christian, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The figure is as though I had been lashed to him, the corpse of a dead person. And he's having to carry it about, as was true with the slave in Rome. And he committed murder. Who shall deliver me? Now watch out. What's the answer to that? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, not by Jesus Christ our Lord, but through what Christ has done. The Spirit is going to deliver I've had a controversy for years with the Keswick movement in this country. Charlie Trumbull, who was editor of the Sunday School Times, was the head of that movement. And he was one of my closest bosom friends. And he knew very well that, that I did not hold what was taught in the Keswick movement. He knew that. And yet the Keswick movement adopted my little book on the spiritual life as the authentic and, and, and identified and recognized statement of the spiritual life. They accepted that when I taught the very thing they didn't hold. What did I teach? Well, I taught that deliverance comes from the third person of the Godhead and not from the second person. And they just thoughtlessly, continually said that it was Jesus that delivered me. Didn't. Now, I know I can do all things through Christ strengthening me. Yes, I know that. And I know he said, apart from me, he can do nothing. But when it comes to the great doctrine of deliverance from evil, it's always by the power of the indwelling spirit. He is the deliverer. But on what ground can he do it? On the ground of something that Christ has done, and I'm not ready to take that up with you, that we passed over in the sixth chapter of Romans already. On the ground of something that has been done, it is true, Jesus Christ our Lord, let me make a parallel. Supposing you're talking about an unsaved person and regeneration for that person, you're bound to say that the regeneration will be by the Holy Spirit. He's the regenerator, yes. But he'll do it through what Christ has done on the cross and, and providing a ground of forgiveness. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, the will of God. But with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. For a good many years, I led the music in the Moody Convention, the Al Moody's Convention in Massachusetts. 
And we had the great speakers from across the sea there. One morning I was leading the music with about 3,000 people present, and Camel Morgan was about to speak. He came onto the platform and whispered to me and said, Please sing, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So I turned to it and announced it, and we opened the meeting with the sing. Him Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You don't know what it is. And uh, when we got to the third verse, he stopped us and said, Now I want to change this hymn. Instead of saying, Prone to Wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. He said, I want you to sing, prone to worship, Lord, I feel it. Prone to serve the God I love. Now that was some of his Arminianism. He was an out and Arminian. That's some of his misunderstanding that due to his theology. But he was in authority and by the way we wanted it sung, we sang it. Not long ago I was in the East, and I picked up a new hymn book just off the press, and was looking at it, and it opened up to that hymn, and I glanced through it, and to my amazement, they had changed the hymn in the book so that it read the way Morgan had it, prone to worship, Lord, I feel it, prone to serve the God I love instead of prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Now, which one is right? I want you voting on this now. Which one is right, prone to wander, or uh, how many think it's prone to wander? How many think it's prone to worship? How many don't think? <laughs> or how many would dare say it's both? Thank you for that. Of course it's both. Have I been talking here for a nearly 30 minutes and made no headway yet? Of course it's true. Within you there is prone to worship and prone to serve. And within you that is prone to wander and to prone to leave. Two natures. You can't get it more positively taught than you have it here in this verse. This verse 25. Two natures. And that's true of you and it's true of me. It was true of the Apostle Paul. And he took testified that to be true. You have two natures. Now then... The good nature cannot, uh, the, the fact that you're saved cannot possibly be depended upon as sufficient to overcome the old nature. That's the, that is the message of this passage. That just because I'm saved, I can't live the life. I can't. I've got to learn to depend upon the Spirit. When I depend upon the Spirit, my failure will be turned, turned into victory when I depend upon the Spirit. If by means of the Spirit you're walking, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Of the flesh. I want to go back with you to the six of Romans again. What has happened to this old nature? Something has been done about it. And look at the verse six, please, which is the Climax statement in this argument. Everything's leading up to this. Knowing this, that our old man was or is crucified with him when he was crucified. I'm just reaching out into our next lesson we'll have on Tuesday regarding the death of Christ as a judgment of this sin nature. All I'm trying to say to gather this up is this, that the nature is judged. You've not got to get it judged. It is judged. It isn't something for you to do or to claim. You're to act upon the, the provision. Look at verse 11. What shall I do? Reckon this thing to be true. Lady said to me somewhere some time ago, what does that word reckon mean? Well, I said, very simply, just believe. Believe the thing is true. Believe what? That my sin nature is judged. 